The emergence of movements to reform the nation defines the next era of American history. An optimistic faith in human nature and a desire for order and control inspired efforts to create new institutions of reform, institutions suited to the realities of the new urban age. American intellectuals were painfully aware of the low regard in which Europeans held their American culture. Americans responded by embracing a movement known as Romanticism and committed themselves to the liberation of the American spirit. The Hudson River School of Painters, inspired by Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, considered nature far more than civilization the best source of wisdom. American painters of the Romantic era seem to announce that in America, unlike in Europe, wild nature still exist, existed and that America held greater promise than the overdeveloped lands of the old European world. In American literature, James Fenimore Cooper distinguished his work with the evocation of the American West. His most important novels, The Last of the Mohicans and The Deerslayer, examine the experience of the rugged white frontiersmen with Indians and pioneers, violence, and the law. Cooper evoked the ideal of the independent American with a natural inner goodness. Walt Whitman, America's urban poet in New York City, celebrated democracy, the liberation of the individual, and the pleasures of the flesh. Less exuberant was Herman Melville, author of Moby Dick, who used his work to criticize the harsh, individualistic, achievement-driven culture of 19th century America. Edgar Allan Poe, a Southern writer, evoked images of individuals rising above the narrow confines of intellect and exploring deeper and often terrifying worlds of spirits and emotions. Other Southern writers focused on ordinary people and poor whites and treated them deliberately and sometimes painfully vulgar and realistic. That movement found its strongest voice in the works of Mark Twain. The Transcendentalists, led by Ralph Waldo Emerson, explored paths to beauty and truth by rejecting understanding and pursuing transcendent states of consciousness. Transcendentalists worked for communion with the natural world through individuality and a rejection of society itself. Henry David Thoreau's own effort to free himself, immortalized in his book Walden, led him to build a small cabin in the Concord, Maine woods where he lived and he wrote for a period of two years. His 1849 essay, Resistance to Civil Government, extended his critique to the artificial constraints in American society and government and argued for a total rejection of unjust laws like slavery. The Transcendentalists were among the first Americans to anticipate the environmental movement in the 20th century, despite having no scientific basis for the defense of wilderness. Transcendentalism also spawned visions of American utopias. At Brook Farm near Boston, Transcendentalists like Nathaniel Hawthorne saw their experiments at cooperative societies fail. Though his later writings, including The Scarlet Letter and The House of Seven Gables, he argued that the price individuals pay for cutting themselves off from society was a serpent that lay at the heart of human misery. Attempts to organize cooperative, egalitarian, or equal societies continued throughout the second half of the century in America. At the Oneida community in upstate New York, all residents were married to all other residents. There were no permanent conjugal ties. It was not an experiment of free love, though. It was a place where the community monitored sexual behavior, where women were protected from, from unwanted childbearing, where children were raised communally, often seeing little of their own birth parents. Oneidans took pride in what they considered women's liberation from the demands of male lust from the, and from the bonds of traditional family roles. The Shakers, too, redefined traditional gender roles. Defined by their practice of shaking themselves free of sin, they were Christians committed uh, to simple lives and complete celibacy, which meant, of course, no one could be born into the faith because no one had sex. All Shakers had to choose the faith voluntarily, so it was a faith comprised entirely of celibate adults. This practice, of course, greatly limited their numbers, but a small pocket of Shakerism survives today. These new modes of living were not only motivated to equalize gender roles. These romantics were trying to create a society set apart from the chaos and disorder they believed had come to define American life. Mormonism, perhaps the most American religion in the world, was created during this era. Joseph, uh, Joseph Smith, at the age of 24, published his Book of Mormon, which he had translated from a set of golden tablets he'd found in the hills of New York, as revealed to him by the angel of God. The Book of Mormon tells the story of two ancient Native American civilizations whose people had anticipated the coming of Christ. Smith believed Jesus came to America after his resurrection, an event not mentioned in, tr uh, in traditional Christian Bibles. Though both Native societies collapsed because of their eventual rejection of Christian principles, Smith believed his history of these righteous societies could serve as a model for a new holy community in the United States. 
His group of followers, the Latter-day Saints, spent 15 years searching for a hospitable place to practice their faith. The radical religious doctrines, claims of new prophets, new scripture, divine authority, and later polygamy within the faith, was always met with persecution from their neighbors. Driven from community to community, Brigham Young, who had assumed the leadership after Smith was murdered, took his 12,000 followers across the Great Plains and over the Rocky Mountains to present-day Salt Lake City, where the Mormons created a lasting settlement. Like other experiments in so, uh, so, uh, social organization of the era, Mormonism reflected a belief in human perfectibility. God had once been a man, the church taught, and thus every man or woman could aspire to move continuously closer to God. Mormonism created a haven for white people demoralized by the disorder and uncertainty of the secular world, and in their society they found security and order. The reform impulse in America helped uh, create new movements intent on remaking American society, movements which incorporated women into the rank and file and in the leadership. By the 1830s, such movements had become fully organized reform societies. Protestant revivalism, rooted in the Second Great Awakening, had evolved into a powerful force for social reform by the 1820s. New Light Evangelicals embraced the optimistic belief that every individual is capable of individual salvation, and they focused their early efforts against drunkenness. No social vice, temperance advocates argued, was more responsible for crime, disorder, and poverty in America than the excessive use of alcohol. Women were attracted to the cause because they knew that men abused their wives and neglected their families under the influence of alcohol. Nativists, on the other hand, joined the cause as a way to bring order to unruly immigrant populations. By 1840, temperance, or the movement to get rid of alcohol to, or to outlaw alcohol, had become a major national movement, boasting more than a million followers who had taken a formal pledge to abstain from hard liquor. For some Americans, a search for individual and social perfection promoted new theories in human health and science. Threats to public health were sources of insecurity that spawned many reform movements, especially after the terrible cholera epidemics of the 19th century. Mid-century Americans were eager for scientific progress that would improve their lives. They spent their free time in spas and varied their diets according to the newest ideas of health and wellness. They also embraced the science of phrenology, which used skull measurements to supposedly ascertain individual fitness for individual pursuits and professions. Medicine lagged behind in this era of rapid technological and scientific advancement. The smallpox vaccination had been a brilliant adaptation of an old folk remedy, and physicians tended to mistrust innovation and experimentation during this era. However, in 1843, Boston essayist Oliver Wendell Holmes published a study that supported the idea of contagion theory, the, uh, the idea that diseases might be transmitted from person to person. This theory was vindicated when a Hungarian physician discovered that hand washing and instrument sterilization virtually ended the transmission of infectious diseases in his lab. Education reform arrived in 1837 when Horace Mann and his followers uh, reorganized the Massachusetts school system, lengthened the academic year, and introduced new methods of professional training for teachers. To Mann, education was the only way to preserve democracy for an, en uh, for an educated electorate was essential to a free political system. By the 1850s, the principle of tax-supported elementary schools was established in every American state. By the Civil War, the United States had one of the highest literacy rates in the world, reaching 94% in the North and 83% of the white population in the South. New institutions to help the disabled, the orphaned, and the unable or unstable were spawned out of the Reform era. Schools for the blind, orphanages, and asylums for criminals and the mentally ill were established to give America's most marginalized populations dignified places for education and self-improvement. New forms of prison discipline, including solitary confinement, were created with the explicit goal of uplift and rehabilitation. That same impulse moved American politicians away from relocation policies and toward the establishment of reservations for Native Americans, just as prisons, asylums, and orphanages would provide society with an opportunity to train and uplift misfits and unfortunates within white society, so too the reservations might provide a way to undertake what one official called the great work of regenerating the Indian race. Many of the women involved in the reform efforts of the 1820s and 1830s came to resent the social and legal restrictions that limited their ability to effect change. As some uh, men protested efforts by their wives, mothers, and sisters to participate in the temperance and abolition movements, le leaders like Harry Beecher Stowe, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, Stanton and uh, uh, Susan B. Anthony countered with moral arguments for an equal obligation between the sexes 
to work for a just and fair society. These women became, perhaps inadvertently, the first American feminists. At the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention in London, female delegates were turned away by the men who controlled the proceedings. Over the next several years, American women worked to highlight the parallels between the plight of women and the plight of African slaves. And in 1848, they met in Seneca Falls, New York, to discuss the question of women's rights. Out of that event came the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions, written almost exclusively by Quaker women, which stated that all men and women are equal, are created equal, and that the right to vote belonged to both sexes. In demanding that right, these American feminists launched a movement for women's suffrage that would last until the right was made law in America in 1920. <clears throat> Though the anti-slavery movement had existed for some time, see the creation of the nation of Liberia, only by 1830 did it begin to gather the force that, that would make it the most urgent reform movement in American history. With slavery spe spreading rapidly uh, with the explosion of cotton across the South, William Lloyd Garrison emerged as an articulate leader of the abolitionist movement in America. Garrison's philosophy was so simple that it was genuinely revolutionary. Opponents of slavery, he said, should not talk about the evil influence of slavery on white society, but rather the damage the system did to blacks. They should therefore reject gradualism and demand the immediate abolition of slavery and the extension to blacks of all the rights of American citizenship. His newspaper, The Liberator, was as unapologetic as it was fervent on the issue and attracted a rapt audience among the free black population of the North. Black leaders, including David Walker, Sojourner Truth, and Frederick Douglass, also emerged as powerful and eloqu eloquent spokespeople for the cause of the abolition of slavery. Douglass, a former slave, had escaped to Massachusetts in 1838 and emerged as an electrifying orator when he lectured on the subject in, in England. Upon his return to America, he purchased his freedom from his Maryland owner and started his own abolitionist newspaper. He wrote an autobiography that painted a damning portrait of slavery in America. In response to the abolitionist movement, anti-abolitionists rose up in the South and in small pockets in the North. Southerners understood the implications abolition would have on their way of life. While Northerners feared an influx of Southern blacks and worried a civil war might erupt over the issue. In Philadelphia in 1834, anti-abolitionists burned an abolitionist headquarters to the ground and stated, uh, started a race riot. Another mob seized William Lloyd Garrison on the streets of Boston a year later and threatened to hang him. In Illinois, Elijah Lovejoy, the editor of an abolitionist newspaper, was killed when he tried to defend his printing press from attack. That so many men and women continue to em embrace absolutism in the face of such vicious opposition suggests that abolitionists were not people who made their political commitments lightly. They were a minority of moral crusaders who, whose fervency, not unlike America's early, uh, earlier revolutionaries, threatened to upset the social and political order of the entire nation. The abolition movement splintered in 1840 as an increasingly radical element led by William Lloyd Garrison embraced a host of uh, related issues. The full incorporation of women into the cause, extreme pacifism that rejected even defensive wars, opposition to all forms of coercion, including prisons, the outright condemnation of the US, U.S. Constitution, and finally, the call for Northern disunion from the American South. That's the radical point of view. After 1840, the cause of abolition moved in many channels, spoke with many different voices, moderate voices for the cause, appealed to the conscience of slave owners. When that produced no results, they turned to political action, seeking to induce the Northern states and the federal government to aid the cause. The Amistad case, in particular, signifies a slow but steady progress of the cause. Another voice, the, the Liberty Party, uh, never campaigned for outright abolition. They stood instead for free soil, or for keeping slavery, and in essence blacks, out of new American territories. The ideology did what abolition never could. It attracted the support of large numbers of the white population in the North. Uh, I mentioned the Amistad case, and of course that's a, that's a great movie called Amistad. It's about a, a slave ship that is commandeered by uh, slaves and is, uh, they sort of earn their freedom by taking over the, the ship and sailing it into more friendly waters. Those frustrated with the slow pace of political progress sometimes resorted to dramatic action, including violence, to free or emancipate slaves. It was a group of prominent abolitionists in New England who funneled money and weapons to John Brown for his bloody uprisings in Kansas and Virginia. Others attempted to arouse public anger through propaganda. The most powerful of all abolition propaganda was Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which flew off sore shelves and had to be reprinted repeatedly. 
That book succeeded in bringing the message of abolition to an enormous new audience, both in book form and on stages across the country where, where it was turned into a play. Reviled throughout the South, Stowe became a hero in the movement. Her novel ignited sectional tensions in both the North and the South. Though the abolition movement failed to achieve significant progress before the Civil War, the men and women of the cause kept the flame lit for nearly three decades, gradually revealing to the American people the hypocrisy of slavery in a nation dedicated to freedom.